Today we're going to go through my seven biggest mistakes I see new producers making. Hey guys, welcome to EDM Tips. Now after over 20 years of producing electronic dance music myself and over two and a half years of teaching thousands of new producers how to produce dance music, there are a few things that I see time and time again that people make as mistakes. So today we're gonna go through these mistakes and hopefully knowing them will help you try and avoid them. Now you will keep making some of them. We all do, I'm still guilty of it, but being aware of it can really help you move past them when you can catch yourself doing them. Now if you are a brand new producer you can download my free producer starter pack below this video. It's got some samples, it's got some cheat sheets to help you get past some mental blocks. Thanks for subscribing. If you like this video please share it with your friends. I really want to build this channel up this year, try and get 50,000 subscribers if possible so that's my goal. Yeah so without further ado let's look at these seven biggest mistakes I see new producers making. So one and this might sound a bit weird but it's being a precious snowflake. And what do I mean by that? I mean that you think that what you're doing is amazing or you've got some massive artistic vision you need to get out there in the world. And what that does, it can stop you from actually just getting music produced because you don't want to sound like other people. You don't want to copy other people. You've got this unique artistic vision and you want to change the world. The truth of the matter is you're making dance music, man. You want to make people lose their shit. That's what you do. People have got stress in their lives. They go out, they want to dance and your music helps them do that. So it is important. So don't be so precious about creating something completely original. Listen to music you love, try and copy it, try and replicate it. And over time, you will start developing your own style anyway. So number one is don't be a precious snowflake. Don't be afraid to copy. What you do is important, but your music's not going to be the most original until you start copying other people. Now two, and this is huge, and I'm guilty of this all the time, it's obsessing over one track and overproducing it. And what happens is you can spend so much time tweaking these sounds that you lose the original kind of creative flow that you had when you started the track and you can actually start damaging the track and making it worse than it was. And that is one massive issue with overproducing. So if you're spending 40, 50 hours on a track, in my opinion, that's too long. You know, if I hit 20 hours on a track, that's the absolute maximum time I want to spend on it and that includes mixing down that includes amendments for a client or if I'm working with another producer or singer that includes a mastering stage as well so I want to get that initial idea down that initial track in four five maybe six hours and then I can start doing the mixing stage after that with fresh ears but really you want to be getting those initial ideas down as quickly as possible to keep the creativity fresh and not obsessing over these little things that no one else is going to notice anyway. It's the main ideas that are really important and they come quickly. The second thing about not obsessing too much over tracks is that the more tracks you write, the more tracks you finish, which brings me to point three, finishing tracks, which is kind of ties into point two about not obsessing. But the benefit of finishing music is twofold. One, if you know that hard drive full of eight bar loops that you've got, they don't count for anything, man. You've got to get your music finished before you can get it released, before you can get it out into the world, and before you can even play it to your friends and family, for goodness sake. Having an eight bar loop is a, is a great start, but it counts for nothing unless you finish that track. And the other point about finishing music quickly is that the more music you finish, the more practice you get. So, for instance, if you spend, say, four months on one song, that's one bass line, one melody, one chord progression that you've spent four months on. Now, if you were to finish four tracks in a month, so that's one per week, by the time you've reached those four months, that's 16 tracks you've actually completed. So that's 16 bass lines, 16 drum rhythms, 16 melodies, 16 lots of sound design. Just think how much more practice you're going to have had and all of these different things than if you were just concentrated on one track for four months. So that is a huge one. Mistake four is thinking that you need the newest plugin, uh, the newest equipment to make your music sound good. It's simply not true. You can get everything you need for under $500. You can get a laptop, you can get a semi good pair of headphones. When I upgraded my headphones to something that cost me £130, which is about $160, it made a big difference to me. So I wouldn't use completely crap equipment. You know, I would spend a bit of money on uh, some semi good headphones. But really, the most important thing is to get used to those headphones. 
compare other music, professionally released music, and then listen with yours and think, okay, well, where's mine falling down? Why doesn't it sound as good as that music that I love and I'm listening to? And that is more important than spending money on the latest plugin. You can do pretty much everything with the stock plugins in whichever door you've got. So if it's FL Studio, if it's Ableton Live, or if it's Logic Pro, they all come with stock plugins that are good enough to produce world-class music because people have done it and they've released it and they've had huge hits using the stock plugins in their door. So don't worry too much about getting that new expensive plugin. Okay, point five, and we're gonna go into a bit more technical stuff now. So with all the songs that people send me to give them feedback on, one of the biggest mistakes I see is people not using the auxiliary channels in their door. I'm not really gonna go into everything you can do with using auxiliary channels in this video. But the main thing is to have global effects that you can apply to several tracks in your mix. So you might have two reverb auxiliary channels, you might have a delay, you might have a couple more. But if you use the send knobs to send some of your tracks to those auxiliary channels, you can then cut out the low end from the reverb, you can add sidechain compression to the reverb. Basically, it gives you a lot more control than having a different reverb or whatever effects you've got on every single different track. That can really muddy up the mix and it can take away the control. So that is a technical mistake I see a lot of new producers making. That was a real game changer for me using auxiliary channels. Point six is a huge one for me and you would have heard me talk about it before, but it's not checking your mix in mono very often. So I have a plugin on my master channel, just a utility in Ableton Live, and I've got a shortcut which allows me to quickly change between hearing my whole mix in mono and my whole mix in stereo because people like to load in these presets in their synths in serum or silent or whatever and they've got all these effects on them already and they sound really wide they sound freaking amazing on their own but when you start putting them all into a mix on these big wide stereo sounds suddenly when you hear that mix on a car stereo or an iphone or something else it sounds muddy and it it, it lacks clarity and that's because the stereo field is getting very busy and very washed out. So if you have a plugin so you can switch to mono and check your mix often, make sure that it works in mono. This is one of the most important things that I have found when listening and producing dance music is making sure it sounds good in mono. Because if it does, in stereo, it's gonna sound amazing. Okay, point seven, this is my final point and this is huge and it is referencing other people's music. So specifically professionally released tracks that you can compare yours to, but it's important to do that properly. And I'll link to a, a video that I did before about how to reference properly. But basically you want to load in a reference track or a ghost track into your door, turn the volume down a bit because it's already been mastered. So it's not gonna be a fair test. And then basically switch it on and off and compare your music to that and try and listen intentionally and really pay attention to, to what the producer's done. So if your, if your synths aren't sounding fat or if your stabs aren't sounding fat, try and listen to how they've layered the synths that they've got in their track and just keep working at yours until you get it sounding as fat. And this is the point where you can kind of search on YouTube for these specific videos, like how to layer synths, and then focus on that one thing. And then you'll learn these little tricks about what these other producers do. You might even be able to find them doing tutorials on YouTube. And then you're gonna have this tool. You would have learned this new trick for how to make your synths fat or something like that that you can use again and again in every track from then on. And then this new skill is with you forever. And that can only come from really listening carefully listening and referencing other tracks properly. A good example of how this worked for me is the first remix competition I ever won in, don't know, 2010, something like that. And the track I referenced was Benny Benass's Satisfaction. And I thought, right, I'm gonna up my game in these two days, I'm gonna enter this competition and I'm gonna win. And it was only by really carefully listening to this Benny Benassi track and not taking anything other than getting the very best sound I could to match his, that I won that competition. I got my first record deal. I got my first agent from doing that. And I can honestly attribute that to really carefully listening to this reference track and just not quitting until I got mine sounding as fat and as good as that. And there you have it, guys. They are my seven biggest mistakes that I see new producers 
and old producers making. I hope this helps you avoid making some of them. Again, if you're a completely new producer, don't forget to download my free EDM producer starter pack below this video. Thanks for subscribing and until next time, cheers and happy producing.